Ani, Boju, Tanse, Edlanate, Nit. Uh, welcome to this Pow Wow Education Week discussion, uh, which we have called Feasting the Future, Pow Wow and Black Indigenous Futures. Uh, my name is Curtis Maloli. I am an educational developer at the Center for Excellence in Learning and Teaching at Ryerson. Uh, I'm honored to be able to introduce today's guests uh, and to tell you a little bit about how this discussion came about. The title for the session, Feasting the Future, uh, are, is actually based on a, a reference to the words of, of one of our guests today, Dr. Karen Recolette, uh, who is an associate professor at the University of Toronto. Uh, and who participated in a treaty education panel at last year's powwow. Uh, at one point in that discussion, Karen made reference uh, to what she called the, the world building venture of powwow. Uh, and she discussed powwow as, um, as a space where, where it might be possible to, to feast the future, but to also uh, forge new decolonial futures. Uh, and last year's panel uh, can still be streamed on Ryerson uh, Ryecast uh, if you missed it or if you would like to revisit it. Um, it was an incredible discussion that covered a wide array of, of topics and, uh, you know, meanings related to powwow and to, and to treaty. Uh, and then, of course, over the course of this past year, themes of both Black and Indigenous futurism um, were also raised in several writings at the Yellowhead Institute at Ryerson. Um, especially in the context of Indigenous and Black Lives Matter uprisings. In July, Dr. Karina Vernon, uh, another guest with us today, uh, wrote a piece for Yellowhead entitled Black Indigenous Futures in Art, Literature, and Black Lives Matter. Uh, and in that piece, she imagines how solidarity between Black and Indigenous peoples can be the foundation for an alternate future um, beyond, settler, uh, the, beyond the settler colonial state. Uh, Karina is an associate professor at the University of Toronto Scarborough, uh, and we're thrilled that she could be here with us today. Um, and our, our third speaker, who is also a collaborator in organizing this discussion, is Dr. Megan Scribe, an assistant professor in Ryerson's Department of Sociology, uh, and a friend who I've had the privilege of getting to know over the past year, as we've discussed anti-colonial teaching practices together with other colleagues at Ryerson. Uh, this summer, Megan uh, also wrote a piece for Yellowhead with Stephanie Habtome uh, called To Breathe Together, Co-Conspirators for uh, Decolonial Futures. Uh, and together, they also fleshed out uh, what it might mean to, to co-conspire, um, a metaphor I think that uh, Megan will unpack for us a little bit in this session. Uh, and to, in that co-conspiring, to unmake the world of settler colonialism uh, or to remake relations on more just terms. Uh, as you can no doubt see, we are starting this discussion today with a very rich groundwork in place, so I'm excited to turn this over to our guests. Uh, each guest will have an opportunity to uh, quickly locate their work and their thinking in relation to, uh, to our theme uh, and in the context of Pow Wow, and they'll have a chance to uh, then get into a discussion together to ask each other questions um, and, to, and to deepen uh, this discussion together. Um, so this discussion in many ways has grown out of a seed that, uh, that Karen planted last year. So uh, Karen, can I ask you to start? Thank you, Curtis. It was a beautiful um, introduction into this uh, gathering space that we're uh, co-curating uh, today. So thank you very much for that. Um, I just wanted to clarify one thing is that I'm still an assistant professor, um, so not quite associate yet, um, which means that, um, you know, I still have this kind of like newness um, in a lot of these fears. So um, still learning, um, still, um, you know, widening my understanding of certain relationships. And so in that, I just wanted to speak to what the kinds of um, conversations I was inspired and, and invited into with Susan Blight and Hayden King last year um, during our talk that we did um, at Ryerson that was hosted there in such a beautiful and generous way that um, we began to think through how powwow as almost like a choreography of futurity. Um, and I was thinking about the work of Susan Blight and Hayden King in kind of thinking about what are the indigenous geographies um, in Toronto that um, that we can talk about these kinds of geographies that have a very expansive 
idea of what landing is and means for um, both Indigenous um, and Black communities in and around Toronto. So I began to think through some of the um, work that I had done in relation with other folks, dancers, choreographers, um, thinkers, about like round dances as um, glyphs that were in motion that activated sort of a jumping scale to borrow the phrase from uh, Laura Harjo um, that acted sort of like a way of jumping scale from settler colonial and um, anti-Black um, structures of, um, of landing. So I began to think through how these articulations of movement and gesture are forms of glyphing, um, embodied glyphing by dancers, um, by those who are producing the hand drum songs, um, by drummers um, in a space that is the powwow. So in that, I began to think through the ways in which these are choreographies of futurity that are spaces where we can imagine the possibility, the alternative possibilities of landing and falling into a set of relationships in different ways and thereby kind of putting the focus more on a landing process rather than being bracketed um, and um, confined by this idea that um, Indigenous folks are only um, in relationship to land, practice, to land as territory. So the focus being on landing was more about um, bringing in the speculative to kind of think through alongside Afrofuturists, um, such as Nalo Hopkinson, Octavia Butler, um, and Kay Jamison, to think about ways in which we fall into a set of relationships. We fall into a set of um, landing spaces or landing glyphs. So that's kind of where I kind of would like to situate um, my offering today is to think about landing as an emergent geography and perhaps as a diasporic indigenous and black practice of falling into a set of relationships. Wow, thanks so much, Karen. That was tremendously moving um, and exciting intellectually to think of um, that different way of thinking about landing. Um, I wanna just take a moment to thank um, Curtis and Karen and Megan for including me in this powwow. Um, it feels amazing to be as a black person in conversation with you here in this space. And um, when Hayden King invited me in July to write something for the Yellowhead Institute about black indigenous relationships around black life matters, I also found that invitation really tremendously moving. Um, so he, his invitation um, said, you know, Black and Indigenous relationships have not always been easy on Turtle Island. Um, would you write a piece for us thinking, thinking this through? And so, so that's what I did. Um, you know, the Black liberation struggle on Turtle Island has been so much um, invested in the idea of further integrating ourselves into the settler colonial regime, you know, into um, finding our piece of the pie, so to speak. And I think that a lot of our troubles in, in, in our relationships have revolved around this conception of liberation as integration into a settler colonial framework. And, you know, what happened this summer at the end of May, you know, revealed as Dion Brand said, the exoskeleton of the world, the fact that black people have been living an emergency for 450 years on Turtle Island and that the settler nation state betrays black people. You know, even as we have been trying to integrate ourselves into this framework, the settler colonial state only betrays our citizenship and I think it was on May 31st that I saw a, across my 
Facebook feed, um, an incredible image. Um, the Mohawk, Mohawk folks at um, Ganawake erected a huge Black Lives Matter sign. And um, they posted it on Facebook with the hashtag justice for George Floyd. And I was just so incredibly moved, just so incredibly moved by that, you know, to, to stand up and show up for us like that. Um, and since then I've seen an incredible image by an artist from uh, Bol Soleil First Nation named Sista Kennedy who created this incredible artwork depicting um, a black person and an indigenous person clasping arms, even as there's two police officers flanking them. And the caption on that image reads, know that we stand alongside you. May the systems that attempt to oppress and eliminate us collapse beneath our unity and resilience. Hashtag Black Lives Matter. And this shook me. You know, and for me, this opens up a new political imagination. Um, in turn, Black Lives Matter activists have been showing up for Indigenous folks. You know, the recent actions in Toronto, where BLMTO activists have been throwing paint on the monuments to colonialism and slavery. You know, tear down monuments to colonialism and BLM activists in Montreal tearing down the John A. Macdonald statue. To me, this is already showing a performance of a new imagination that is just growing stronger and stronger every day. You know, the future for diasporized people on Turtle Island is, I think, what, what, what this moment is showing me. It's not a further integration into the colonial settler regime. But a thinking about a way, the ways that we need to um, uplift Indigenous people um, in their nations and um, think about um, how to respect um, Indigenous laws and our responsibilities as people having been landed or displanted in Indigenous nations here on Turtle Island. So, this is going to involve a lot of education and I guess at some point I want to ask Karen about your work on treaty education because I think this is one way forward perhaps um, into a new political imagination for black folks on Turtle Island. Anyway, that's what I've been thinking about lately. Thank you so much, Karina. Wow, I also really appreciate that last question. You are going to follow up with later about treaty uh, relationships and creating treaties. Actually, I want to hear more about that too. And I mean, we've been signing treaties for centuries and why is it just with Canada? Why don't we think about treaties with other peoples? Um, uh, so yeah, before I uh, introduce and situate myself in this conversation, I would also like to thank Curtis. It's just been a pleasure to get to know you over the last year. And I also think of you as a good friend and I look forward to the good work we're gonna do together. And thank you, Karen and Karina. Um, I really appreciate the work that you do and the community that you offer. Um, I feel surrounded in the best possible way. So it's um, really nice to go last because I feel very well cushioned um, by, you know, you doing the work um, and it makes it possible for me to do this work in turn. So um, just for those of you who are going to be viewing this um, panel later, um, uh, I've known Karen and Curtis for a while now, and I'm actually meeting Karina for the first time over Zoom. So I'm actually really excited by the fact that we're having our first meeting in such a meaningful way to have these conversations about our passions and our life together. Um, so for some of you, this, uh, my introduction is not new. And then for others, uh, you might be hearing it for the first time, but I'm a two-spirit indigenous feminist. I'm a writer, a researcher, and an educator. And I'm from Norway House Cree Nation, and that's in Northern Manitoba. And I've been living in these shared territories for the last 13 years. 
So both of these places and the people in these places figure centrally in my work. And on the surface, when I tell you about the things that I think about and the things that I do and the people I work with, it might not make sense right away. Uh, but when I tell you about the relationships that thread all of these uh, pieces of work together, I think it'll make a lot more sense. So um, I recently completed my dissertation and it's called Indigenous Girlhood, Narratives of Colonial Care in Law and Literature. And that work uh, really focuses on the experiences of Indigenous girls as they're navigating and co-creating their own worlds within a white settler society. And I look at the stories that are told about them. I look at stories that are told about them in law, uh, stories that are told about them through official reports and stories that are told um, by our own community members um, and the different effects each of these kinds of stories will have in the lives of indigenous girls. Um, so in a lot of ways, my work is hard to hear. It's hard to talk about, uh, but in other ways, I like to prioritize and work towards creating work about Indigenous girls and for Indigenous girls that is imagining worlds and futurities beyond this white settler society. Um, so at some point in this conversation, I want to return um, to your work, Karen, about jumping scale, because I, I haven't worked with that theory in the past, but I think that um, it may be because of this conversation, I'll find a way to integrate it into my work and help me think in a bigger way about worlding and futurity um, from this place and from using this as the starting point, because um, I think one of the things that I can't escape or I'm constantly aware of in my own work is that we're not starting from a blank slate um, when we're worlding. We're starting from uh, Canada, I guess, and everything that it just sat on top of. Um, so, and then, so thinking like, well, how do we jump scale from there, I guess. Um, so uh, that was uh, my dissertation work. And as Curtis mentioned, I co-wrote uh, an article with Safanit Hapton uh, earlier this summer called To Breathe Together. And in that shared piece, we were thinking about how we could uh, come together as Indigenous and Black relations to, um, well, one, critically address state violence, but then also spend time reworlding and imagining decolonial possibilities beyond what we're kind of stuck with or feel stuck with at times. Um, and because this is Powell Week, um, when I was invited to do the panel, I did have the initial thought where I'm like, well, my work doesn't directly necessarily talk about powwows, but um, when I decided to join, I did think a lot about, you know, my community and um, how the work that they've been doing with powwow and ceremony over the last couple of years and how that those personal and collective movements have informed me as a scholar in the work I do. Um, so of course, um, me being me, I have to bring a little bit of home into the conversation. And I think it's completely appropriate um, since we're talking about powwows. So I'll pause there. And then I guess, then I guess we decide who starts asking questions. Thank you. Yeah, so much, um, so much um, brilliant work that you're doing, Megan. It's so inspiring. Um, I, I feel, I feel similarly that, you know, we're, we have the, um, we have the gifts of all of these brilliant thinkers that are around and activating these atmospherics ongoingly. And I just feel so grateful. And I guess that's something that I wanted to think about was um, think alongside um, you folks um, with is to consider this idea of jumping scale um, that, as I mentioned, was expressed uh, first in Austin, Texas. I remember Laura Harjo um, talking about jumping scale as um, a Muscogee um, 
uh, geographer. Um, and I, ever since I've heard that term, I've just been so excited by it in terms of um, falling into a set of relationships. And, um, and that, that thinking of falling into a set of relationships, how do we fall into each other, was actually a question that was gifted to me by um, Tiffany King in conversation. And um, I think that I've been kind of running with that idea is that how do we fall into each other as sort of like a landing um, technology um, and, or maybe even it's a landing treaty. Like how do we, how do we fall into each other? How do we land as a speculative treaty? Because I think most treaties were sort of speculative. They had, these were futurists that were, um, we're thinking about the future and creating an atmospheric around those futures, um, thinking about their future ancestors. So maybe treaty is speculative um, and maybe that's a place of relationality um, that we can think alongside Afrofuturists. Um, so I've been kind of wondering about this book I've been reading um, by N.K. Jameson um, that was actually lent to me by uh, my dear friend, Melanie Newton. Um, and it's called The Fifth Season. And if, I, if you wouldn't mind, I'd like to read a little bit from it because it inspires some of my thinking about the fall. Um, so in this book, um, there is the main character has an ability to cess, which is to um, connect with meteorite and rock. Um, and Megan, when you had said we are starting from Canada and everything that it jumped on top of, I'm thinking about all those relationships to rock and to meteor um, sediment, right? So in this book, um, there's a quote that says, and then his power folds around her and she stops seeing with anything like eyes. It's like a dream she had. She's falling up. And this somehow makes sense. All around her, the place she's falling through is color and faceted flickering like water, except it's purple pale instead of blue or clear, low quality amethyst with a dollop of smoky quartz. She flails within it, sure for an instant that she's drowning, but this is something she perceives with Cessa Pene, and not skin or lungs. She can't be flailing because it's not water and she's not really here, and she can't drown because somehow alabaster has her. Where she flails, he is purposeful. He drags her up, falling faster, searching for something, and she can almost hear the howl of it, the feel of drag of forces like pressure and temperature gradually chilling and prickling her skin. Something engages, something else shunts open, it's beyond her, too complex to perceive in full. Something pours through somewhere, warms with friction, some place inside her smooths out, intensifies, burns. And then she is elsewhere, floating amid immense gelid things. And there is something on them, among them, a containment. It's not her thought. So I guess what I'm what I'm thinking is what Afrofuturist thinkers, um, speculative fiction writers can offer us in terms of articulating this idea or this, this, um, this technology of landing into a set of relationships. And maybe thinking through our relationship with monument, with glyphing practices, mm -hmm. with futurity glyph making is cessing. Maybe what we're doing is we're, we're developing these radical relationships with a landing technology, through a landing technology, to, um, to rock, to concrete, um, to, to forms, which are inspiring all kinds of shapes of gatherings, like powwow, like um, processions, um, like protests in the street. Um, so for me, I think about what are these landing practices and what are our futurity glyphs? And to me, they look like encampments. They look like um, processions. Um, these glyphs are flowing. They're moving. Um, they're not containable. Um, these kinds of futurity glyphs are the actual throwing of paint. It's the, it's the release and it's the flow of the color onto John A. McDonald or to Ryerson 
um, that's the glyph in my mind. And so I like to think about creation stories as well and our relationships to the fall. You know, um, I was taught by my uncle Joseph that we have a falling story from sky being falling and then an adoption story um, by being adopted into a set of relationships. So I think treaties are also speculative adoption stories. Um, how do we become good witnesses? How do we visit? How are we adopted into a series of relationships? And basically, how do we fall into each other? How do we land? Um, yeah, that's, uh, that's what I would say, picking up on what you had expressed. I mean, and when you're talking about using rock or concrete as landing technology um, that supports relationships, I think it really underscores the fact that there's a physicality of relationships. Um, uh, there's, you know, like the rock in place that holds us and then there's our embodied experience of being with ourselves and with one another. Um, and it, it reminds me a lot of something that really struck me from your piece, Karina, that the piece that you wrote for Yellowhead earlier this summer uh, you were doing an analysis of, um, I think it was a short story and the name escapes me, but in the story, the characters swim to an island. Um, and uh, I'm only gonna like do quick paraphrase because I really want you to uh, expand on it more, but the characters are black and indigenous and they're in a relationship together and they're leaving behind everything they know and swimming to this new island um, and so, I don't know, I think there's, there's something in everything we've just said, you know, there's rock and concrete and meteors, islands as landing technologies. Um, and then there's this beautiful analysis you did earlier this summer, Karina, and I, I don't know, I wonder if like, you're seeing connections here too? I am. Um, when Karen was speaking about well, when you were reading from Jemson's story, I was thinking about um, the short story that I wrote about this summer. The short story is by a Black British Columbian author named Wade Compton, and it's from his collection called The Outer Harbor, and it's an Afrofuturist, or as he calls re retro speculative fiction, because it moves backwards and forward in time, and like so much Afro-diasporic um, cultural expression, it's fluid in its time frame. The present is also the past and also carries in it the future. Um, so in that short story, and what made possible my thinking is that in that short story, um, Compton imagines a new land formation emerging out of the Salish Sea off the coast of what we call currently call British Columbia. And so it's a thought experiment, that short story. What would happen to our social relations if a new landform emerged? Um, and one of the things that happens in that short story is that um, a black activist joins indigenous activists to preemptively decolonize the island. But it's it's all, this is where the retro speculative comes in. They decolonize the island that's never been inhabited before. Um, so to preemptively claim it as indigenous territory before the scientists and developers come. Um, and the question, one of the questions that the black character asks the indigenous activists is, should I be here? You know, I'm black, should I be here? And um, the main Indigenous character in that short story rolls his eyes uh, at her question. And I read that as a, as a way of saying, of course you should be here. You're here. Join us. Join us in this new relationship we're going to create off this new land formation. Um, and it's a speculative story. Um, it's, you know, it's fiction. But Karen, the way that you're talking about what 
Indigenous and Black activists have been doing this summer and in this moment with monuments and paint and sidewalks and on the streets tells us that those formations are happening. It's not, it doesn't have to stay in the realm of speculative or in the realm of the future. It's, it's happening currently. Um, and I'm really, really excited about the way that we're meeting each other in this rupture, right? We're part of this long rupture. Our people have been part of this rupture since the beginning and we're still in it and we're still struggling in it. And, um, I find a lot of hope in that. Where should we go in our conversation from here? I think that's amazing. Um, you know, thinking through, I really appreciated how you said we're, we're meeting each other in this long rupture. Um, you know, I think about my own experiences of landing and um you know I, I i kind of landed in in beginning my origin story kind of begins with rupture right because um i was uh i was separated from my birth mother at a very young age and um foster and then adoption and um you know part of me part of me feels like landing um landing as a practice is about, you know, rupture, um, is about intimacy, intimate, an intimate knowing of rupture and intimate embodying of rupture. Um, and it makes sense because when you think about, I remember having this amazing conversation with Buffy St. Marie one day and, you know, just Buffy, you know, no big deal. And, um, Buffy said to me, you know, like stars are rupturing all the time. Like it's, it's, a normal thing to be engaged in, in, in rupture. <laughs> and I was like, Oh my gosh, you're right. You know, like, like, how do we, I used to wonder, how do I fall in love with my rupture? You know, how do I, how do I develop um, an intimacy with, with my rupturous origin story, you know? Um, and that, I think that brought me to rock that brought me to thinking about those rocks on the prairies, for example, um, there's this um, one rock story that Beria Hennecke shares talking about um, Buffalo child stone that was blown up um, in order because it was a site of a spe special and important gathering site, gathering space or gathering glyph um, that was an ancestor, you know, that was a future ancestor, a Buffalo rock. Um, and this rock was uh, was blown up, um, and to make way for Lake Diefenbaker, um, a man-made lake. Um, so, in my speculation, I'm thinking about well, maybe part of that rock um, came here. You know, maybe maybe those who were dislocated from their indigenous territories rode those rocks. You know, um, rose those those little sediments or those little meteorites and fell it into place in, in full acknowledgement of their, their rupture and their, their journeys and their trajectories. So I feel like, you know, for, for a lot of us uh, folks, I'm Cree from Saskatchewan originally, um, you know, for a lot of us, we, we land into place and we're perpetual visitors in other people's homelands. And um, so I think about what are those practices of relationality that I can gesture, that I can curate, that um, can be choreographed in ways that um, are kind and in, and in good relation. Because so many of us, you know, grew up with, and I, here I talk about hip hop a little bit, but so many of us grew up with um, Black cultural expression um, that become part of our soundtrack for the ways in which we grew up in diasporic spaces. You know, how many times did I dance to, you know, um, music that was inspired and, and came out of all of these um, technologies of care and liberation and, um, you know, people so, like coming together to form Black sociality and, and, and celebrate. Um, 
and how catchy that was to me growing up and how I became quite familiar with a lot of that music. Um, and in a way, my landing glyph was, you know, through Black cultural production and the way that I think about my own genealogies are very much grounded in Black relationships to land and to each other and Black community that, you know, for a lot of diasporic Indigenous folks, some of our origin stories involve these very beautiful, um, rich relationships. You're saying so many things I've never heard before, Karen. I mean, you're, you're really blowing my mind here. Um, the way that you talk about land as shifting, you know, that's one thing that there's so many possibilities there. One thing that we have in common, the three of us, is that we're actually all from the prairies. I grew up in Alberta, <laughs> um, in Calgary and north of Calgary. And that's a geography that I return to in my imagination uh, frequently. And my, my recent book that I published is all about kind of surfacing the black, um, black literature of, of the prairies um, and trying to think of ways of doing that that doesn't, you know, claim, um, claim a space for blackness on the prairies without erasing um, um, you know, in, indigenous presence and, and prior uh, important claims on that, on that territory. So all of us have that, the prairies in common, which is really interesting. And yet we're here also, right? You're right. So we've, we've all kind of shifted. The other thing that you said, Karen, that really struck me now is the way that you say that you've let, that you have landed in diasporic cultural spaces as foundational in some way. This is a very beautiful thing. Thanks for saying that. Um, that means a lot to me. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think that also speaks to this idea that diaspora is not a place of loss or a place of lack, you know, that we can find lots of different points of relationality um, and connection and, and groundedness and groundedness to the atmospherical. I mean, that these are, we're rhizomatically rooted downwards, but we're also rhizomatically rooted upwards. And one of the Nalo Hopkinson's work, Brown Girl in the Ring, and thinking about the CN Tower as, I mean, in this, in, I like to think about it as a sort of like um, an otherwise architecture or one that gestures towards the stars as much as it's rooted as a tree standing in the water, as much as it's rooted as, a, as rhizomatically grounded to the earth but it's also rhizomatically grounded to the star worlds. And um, I think about that as a conduit for, you know, thinking through black and indigenous futurisms um, that's been inspired by, you know, Nalo Hopkinson's work, um, that there's all these possibilities in geographies coming together. Um, you know, and I say that with care because, you know, our, our experiences are not you know, the same, and I would never conflate them to sameness, but there are points where we come together, you know, as, um, and maybe it's in the technology of the fall. Um, maybe it, it's in sort of like a, a landing practice. Um, maybe it's a falling into each other, into a set of relationships. Um, maybe it's other forms that you're attending to today in conversation. And I'm, I'm, I, I can't wait to continue to think alongside you both. Um, you know, I, I think that there's some real, um, possibilities and, and as you're mentioning, these are all being activated in the now. I mean, we look out outside at these processions, at these, um, choreographies of futurity building that are happening. I mean, I just witnessed a conversation with, um, Cyrus Marcus Ware and, um, Raven Wings that yeah. 
blew my mind. Like <laughs> my mind was blown, you know. Incredible. Incredible. Oh my gosh. I know. I showed that to my class. It was the first text that we did in my, in my, in my graduate course, this class, because they've said everything. I know. <laughs> <laughs> they said everything. I know. And in such a way that you're just like, yes. Yeah. And yes. Yeah. And, and, and I want to build on this. I want, I want to, you know, whatever you need, I will do. Like, I just so inspired, you know, I think Raven mentioned, um, and this is where the metaphor perhaps of landing comes in as metaphor, you know, the idea that I've landed on recently is that I am a future ancestor or I am an ancestor and, and what that means. And so, yeah, I'm, I was absolutely blown away by that conversation. And I, I think we should, um, I'd like to find the link to that conversation again, the recording so that I can share it as well. It's brilliant. I mean, going back to what Megan, a question that Megan asked, you know, I think, I, I guess to roughly paraphrase you, Megan, you said something like, how do we, you know, how do we move forward into the future when we're starting with Canada having landed on top of, you know, the land and everything like that. And thinking about what you said, um, Karen, about Nalo Hopkinson's Brown Girl in the Ring, she takes that, that image of the CN Tower. I mean, it was built with CN Railway money, you know, the Transcontinental Railway, which was so incredibly destructive. Um, which opened up pathways of settlement, you know, across the territories of Turtle Island, such a, you know, horrible colonial project. But Nalo Hopkinson takes that symbol, right? And then turns it. She works with what she has, right? She works with what she has, what's there. And the Black Lives Matter activists too, Raven Wings and Cyrus Marcus Ware, that paint demonstration also is working with what we have in order, what they do in that moment of splashing the pink paint is to open up a space to speak, right? They open up this critical space to think differently about where we are and what our relationships are within this moment. And so again, that fills me with an incredible hope of what we can do working with what we have. It's here, Canada has landed on on us, but we can work with what we have to open up new spaces to be in relations in new ways with each other. There's a lot of there's a lot of energy right now for this. Yeah. When I think about that um, beautiful art movement with the paint um, on those really uh, awful monuments. Um, it reminds me of Tiffany Lathabo King's, uh, I think it was the first chapter of her book, The Black Shoals, where she's commenting on um, uh, some spray paint uh, activism where BLM was spray painted onto a Christopher Columbus statue in the United States. And she spent time thinking about, well, you know, people were confused. Why would Black Lives Matter? have anything to say uh, about Christopher Columbus. Why would they care? Why is this part of the movement? And she really unpacked how white supremacy, uh, anti-blackness, it's all bound up with settler colonialism, with imperialism. Um, but for various reasons and concerted efforts by the states uh, is we're locked out of that, that we can't access that as part of our collective imagination that uh, Christopher Columbus screwed over black people as well. Um, but with the paint movement that happened here in the city, it, it opens up, like you say, Karina, um, a chance for us to imagine how these monuments and the people represented by these monuments have screwed us over all in different ways. You're on mute. <laughs> Has to happen at least once. 
Yeah, I was just going to say absolutely. Um, I mean, I guess what, when I say rupture, I guess I was, I think about, Karen said, um, Black and Indigenous people, we have our own particular cultures and our own particular histories. And they're distinct from one another. But we were both there in the rupture, you know, Christopher Columbus uh, and all that. We were both there at, at, at the beginning of the violent construction of these Americas. Um, um, this horrible, you know, violent transformation of Turtle Island into a property regime and state apparatus. And our people have been affected differently um, by those processes that transform Turtle Island. But we are all held in some way in this moment of rupture. We're still meeting each other in the rupture. We're still part of it. Um, and so it's really exciting now to think of the ways that we're intertwining our struggles um, because the settler colonial imagination wants to keep us apart, right? It wants to keep our communities apart and it governs us with different colonial structures. You know, black people are subject to, you know, the multiculturalism act and so on and so forth. And so I think that the settler colonial imagination has tried to separate us physically and imaginatively from one another, but we're resisting this in all kinds of ways now and meeting each other and thinking, you know, um, there's a lot of possibilities and there's a lot of energy um, in our refusing the settler colonial imagination and turning toward one another and thinking about how to intertwine our struggles. Yeah. Um, when I'm thinking about the different ways um, Canada and the United States has tried to keep us apart um, and uh, persuade or try and seduce us into aligning ourselves with whiteness in different ways. Um, again, I'm thinking of Tiffany Lithabo King. Um, she's my constant companion, but you know, like she really critiques this um, idea of coalition and solidarity work as not big enough to hold the kinds of relationships that are going to bring us towards liberation and that being together um, and thinking of more expansive ways of being together that are more integrated look more along the lines of maybe like friendship or um, lovers or family. Um, and these are some really, really sturdy um, things that can hold us in a bigger way than coalition. So. Um, I just, I find that so compelling and it stayed with me for a really long time. Um, so that, it was more of a, it's more of a comment than a question. <laughs> yeah, and I, I think, you know, in, in terms of um, thinking about, uh, you know, Tiffany's work and incredible, um, thought projects uh, that Tiffany is involved in. I just, um, you know, it reminds, it makes me think about the ways in which for Indigenous folks who have been, you know, adopted or have had to imagine genealogies otherwise. So people have had to imagine genealogies otherwise and futures otherwise and kinships otherwise um, in a way that you know, is expansive and um, kin building practices um, are uh, very nuanced um, in, in this, you know, on this land, in this lands, in this landing practice that, again, it, it just reminds me of the shapes of our gathering celestially, you know, um, and the incredible uh, hope and possibility, series of possibilities that a gesture towards the kin stellatory has in sort of rupturing settler colonial geographies um, and geographies um, that are based on ongoing forms of conquest that I just, um, you know, I, I can't help but think through what the speculative in relationship with the work of like Tiffany King, um, Mishona Goman, um, other geographers and, and thinkers and um, the possibilities 
that exist um, within within a, a kinship kind of way of thinking. I see that Curtis has dropped in a question for us. Um, Curtis asks, because we're talking about literature a lot. I mean, we're thinking, we're thinking through these questions um, with, with critical theories in our various disciplines, black, um, black uh, cultural studies and indigenous cultural studies. But we're also, there's a thread moving across our conversation. Uh, we're thinking with the work of writers, creative writers. So Curtis asks, why is literature important for you in resisting and refusing the settler colonial project? Um, and I'll just say that for me as a literary critical scholar, as somebody who works in an English department, um, I turn to work by creative writers, first of all, because I find their work so sustaining in this moment, in this really, really difficult moment. It's nourishing and sustaining. Um, it always has been, I think, Black cultural expression, music we've talked about and literature have always been incredibly sustaining um, for Black folks. But I also turn to literature because it offers an, another imagination other than the dominant, different ways of thinking about how we might meet each other, different ways of thinking about the future. So literature slips the logics of where we are right now. You know, when I think about reading Dion Brand and Wade Compton and um, other writers, uh, Calgary author Suzette Meyer, their representational forms offer different ways of thinking, like the speculative, like magic realism, or poetry that has a different language for thinking that, as Dion Brand says, slips the logics of what, of what entangles us in particular kind of relationships now. So that's why I turn to literature because it offers, you know, yeah, another imagination. I'm curious about, um, you know, you, you mentioned um, Jemson's work and, and what, what her work offers. I'm wondering, yeah, I'm wondering how and why you think with literature. I, um, I grew up not liking to read. I, I grew up waiting for my family outside a library and being bored. <laughs> I, I was way active when I was a kid. I just, I was into dance a lot and other things. And I didn't really know that this was going to happen, but I feel in a weird way, in a good way, that literature for me opened up these possibilities of landing or finding a home space that was based upon like radical imagination and just offering something very different than what I was experiencing in my everyday sort of day-to-day -day life. Um, yeah, I think for me, speculative fiction was it's like opening up um, a radical survival toolkit into how we're going to make our way in the future and what kind how do we navigate amongst the you know dismantling of structures um, I started reading it because I wanted to know how to teach my child how to navigate with the stars or how to think alongside the stars as a kinship as a relative as a being that's there to help them work through or navigate difficult terrains um, I really look to this it's almost like a futurity bundle every book that I I've been just loving you know um, uh, it's almost like a necessity for me is literature is, is it's uh, it's a reworlding that I need to know exists and that I, I, I need to follow 
very closely and be in conversation with. What about you, Megan? <laughs> uh, well, you both said two things that um, are absolutely at the core for me, and that's literature opens up way more possibilities um, than a lot of other social theory I've encountered, and it really has just a lot more imagination in terms of being able to theorize systems of power and oppression, but also pathways forward. Um, I haven't seen social theory be able to take on um, both of those things in a really deep and expansive way. Um, so when I think about, you know, like why is literature important for me like in resisting this project, um, I think it has a lot to do with how I came to literature and how I came to uh, reading. Um, came to reading uh, pretty young, like I taught myself how to read by watching closed captions on TV. Um, and from there, it opened up a world um, within a world that I lived in. And, you know, as a child growing up on the reserve, I didn't understand the conditions of growing up where I did. I didn't understand why there was the kinds of violence I was seeing, why there was the kind of um, pain I was seeing. Um, not to say that that's all there was, but I just didn't have an answer for it. And so uh, when I read In Search of April Raintree by Beatrice Coulton Wisner uh, when I was 12, um, that was the first time anyone had ever theorized settler colonialism, uh, Canada's child welfare system, displacement, dispossession. Um, that's the first time that had ever been theorized for me. And um, so I think that literature is a lot more accessible, not the most accessible, but it's a lot more accessible than the social sciences. Um, I will say that I am fortunate and privileged in that my mom went to college. So the reason why that book was in our house is because it was an assigned reading from one of her college courses. Um, so it was there for me in that in that way. So um, there is like literature does um, walk this line of um, being more accessible, but not being the most accessible. Um, but yeah, it was through stories by Indigenous feminist writers like Beatrice Coulton Wisner and um, down the road I read Marie, Maria Campbell's memoir um, and um, more recently like Catherine Overmet's work and all of these texts help me understand this world that I'm living in in a way that um, the, the social sciences can't and so uh, when I actually began my last project looking at Indigenous girls' experiences, um, what I found is that this girl, this subject, um, she disappeared in the pages of Indigenous feminist theory in a lot of ways. When, um, for the most part, Indigenous feminist theory has, um, has had a habit of uh, focusing specifically on Indigenous women's experiences, um, to the exclusion of Indigenous girls, two-spirit and transgender girls and women. Um, and so while I was uh, doing this like huge review of Indigenous feminist theory, I was also reading my books to unwind. And actually that's where I found the girl was in the pages of Thompson Highway's Res Sisters, um, Tracy Lindbergh's Birdie, um, looking at my shelf right now, Nobody Cries at Bingo by Don Dumont. Um, this is where the girl reemerged. Um, so in this way, I think that Indigenous feminist writers are kind of ahead of the curve where they're, they're, um, they're tackling things that, you know, us as scholars aren't necessarily thinking about right now. Um, so I think that's why literature uh, as a tool of resisting has been so important for me as a scholar. Um, yeah. I think that's a wonderful place to end. <laughs> I'm looking at our clock and I, I was so absorbed by the conversation that I, I hope we're on time. I think we're on time. Um, 
the, any quick last last comments anyone wants to make before I before I wrap up? I would just like to say how grateful I am for sharing space with you, brilliant, beautiful people. I, I'm really grateful. Thank you. Me too. I'd like to say the same thing that um, I have not been in conversation with either of you before, but this conversation has filled my heart. And um, I'm just really excited to be in conversation with you again in the future. Is it, um, is it bad if I say me too as well? Um, <laughs> but I, I really mean it with all my heart, me too. Um, and that, yeah, I think that this is how um, this relationship for us starts. So I'm really glad that this is how it began. Uh, I am so grateful to all of you for participating in this. Um, you know, Karen, Karen said there kind of near the end that literature could be a futurity bundle. Uh, I think this conversation is a futurity bundle. Um, it, uh, I'm so happy we recorded this and I'm so excited for all of you to share this with your students and uh, you know, uh, grateful that, that you were willing to, to do this for everyone uh, attending Powwow Education Week. Um, before we leave, I, I also want to thank, uh, do a formal thank you to the Center for Excellence in Learning and Teaching and the Ryerson Library for sponsoring this. Um, I want to say a special thank you to the powwow co-organizers um, and the co-chairs, uh, Jessica Shirk, uh, one of the co-chairs, um, you know, she, uh, it was in a conversation with her that, that I, this idea for this really, um, really crystallized. So, so thanks to, to Jessica as well. Um, thank you to all of you for everything you shared today. This was incredibly generous and um, it was a phenomenal conversation. So thank you very, very much. So, and I'll also say, um, just also thank you to all the, to the attendees um, and, uh, you know, miigwech, hi hi, masi chok, um, tiak thank you everybody. Mm -hmm.